But on Friday, um, Torn is coming with some close friends of ours locally. Alberto's coming. I saw a young cop, I think. Yeah. Torn's organizing a little drinky thing up on the top of Geary. I'm in Dallas. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, well. oh, well. We'll see Sunday if we can do it. I don't get back till Saturday. Yeah. Well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. You don't have to come, but I just... I thought I had to come. I thought I was no. a friend. Well, you're totally right. <laughs> and I know Tom will probably come again to some of the afternoon ones. Anyway, you got that. You're going on. I look forward to it. I hope we can do it. I'll try it. By the way, that was a lot of fun on the Saturday. It was fun, yeah, it was. That was good. Okay. Okay. John was lucky to have such good weather. Wow, that was really Hello? to um, I'll do a review for the go through all lecture notes to tell you what I think is important. Um, the um, I, I'll even do more than that. I'll start off by telling you what you have to worry about. So you have to worry about um, there'll be two problems on DC biasing and regions. I mean, this is subject to change, but this is kind of the planning right now. So I guess you can't hold me to this totally, but it's roughly what I'm thinking about. Two problems on output stages, um, current sources. Can we switch to the camera? 
Get your own piece. <laughs> Look over here. There you go. Well, this direction. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's only a piece of paper over here. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> and two on multi stage circuits. Okay. Amplifiers, etc. Okay. So that's kind of what the organization would probably be like six problems. And okay. So just give you a feel. But, uh, may change us to a certain extent. We haven't written the exam yet, but that's kind of what our outline has been of the exam right now. So we are thinking right now we'll be looking close to that in the exam. That. Okay. Let's um, go over to the, the um, Peter. Okay. Are we coming? Okay, good. All right. Um, <coughs> Okay, the small signal stuff, you should, okay, I, I'd say the important thing of all this early part, the physics, you don't need to worry about, okay? Um, uh, that, that's, but what you do need to worry about is this. How you go from these large signal equations to small signal models, okay? So you should know how to do that, okay? That's how I calculate these derivatives and figure out what, well, figure out relationship between these large signal DC equations and the small signal model that we derive from it. Okay? That was that was that's basically what we need to learn. The physics of the large signal model are not something I'm going to test you on. Okay. Uh, cl clearly you should know these answers here. But you get one page of paper, you can write on both sides any size font you want to use. Okay. okay. There's no open book. One page of paper, one page, and that's it. Okay, the spice stuff, uh, lecture on spice, nothing on that. Well, forget all that stuff. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, if you have any questions, ask me. I'll, you know, I'm not clear on what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Two ports. Clearly, that's very important. To understand what two ports all about. Small signal input resistance, small signal output resistance, and voltage gain, and big G sub M transconductance. Right? We talk about that quite a bit. <coughs> the when I talk about regions of operation, it's kind of something we've been doing a lot, right? We calculate the regions where the transistor goes. Professor Butterson, check mic on. Okay. How's that? Okay. Okay. Interesting beginning here. Um, regions of operation. So we have uh, cutoff, you know, saturation, linear. When I say, when we generally say, you know, you know, what is the maximum voltage or minimum voltage that this circuit can have at, let's say, at the V out point here, what we generally, what we mean is, and we'll say something explicitly if we mean something else, that when are all the transistor in saturation? In other words, at some voltage, this, uh, this transistor will go out of saturation. And we say the maximum voltage swing that you can have is when that voltage goes out of saturation or goes into cutoff. Anything else other than saturation, and that defines the limits of what the voltage swings can be. Okay? 
So that's a pretty typical problem that we deal with. You know, here, for example, when this gets down below a VD sat of this transistor, then you suddenly are in linear region, and that's the limit of the region of operation here, because the gain's going to drop like crazy, as we see right here. Okay? All right. Um, so DC analysis and AC analysis, obviously no difference between those two. Big G sub M, be able to calculate big G sub M and output resistance and voltage gains. That's typical problems that we'll have. And I went through a whole bunch of cases, right? Common source of source to generation, common gate, you know. So you should know, have the equations for all of those answers. I don't, you don't need to derive those in the midterm. So you can go, I want you to go right to the solutions, because these problems we've all worked before, right? So you should have those clearly on your little cheat sheet. And uh, I, if, now, when you do your problems, if you choose the wrong, I do give, we do give partial credit. If you do choose the wrong equation, okay, or, and then that fouls up the rest of your problem, you got to help us out, saying, okay, here's the equation I'm using to calculate this. And from this, I go on and calculate this and this and this. Well, help us out. Show, show what equation you used at each point in time so we know where you made your mistake if you didn't make a mistake. So, you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, give us you know, guidelines on how you solve the problem. You don't need to go in and calculate equations that you've already done before. You can use answers that we've had before. But tell us what you use for your equation. Write things cleanly enough and clearly enough that we can then go in and give you partial credit in case you fouled up. We try not to make the problems hinge on earlier parts, but you know it's pretty much impossible to do. So, uh, so help us out. Okay. Show work, but the, the, the bottom line, the other way of saying that is you need to show your work. You know, but you, the work you need to show is maybe involves just taking pre-calculated equations. Source followers, okay, so all the rest of this is, ba is just the, um, you know, the various, uh, you know, here's the summary solution, summary of all that earlier part. Clearly you should know this stuff cold. Be able to do DC analysis and AC analysis for any of these single transistor circuits. And, of course, be able to put them together and analyze circuits that are put together. Unlikely we'll have any de design-like problems. It's just impossible to grade, right? And so uh, there'll be more all analysis-like problems. Differential pairs, okay? Understand what I analyze those. Differential and single-ended uh, inputs and outputs. And you know, I guess the important thing here is that this change of variables that we do. Understand how to go back and forth between differential and common mode and a voltage at one of these nodes and a voltage, you know, just one voltage at one side. You know, differential and common mode are a linear combination of these two input voltages, and there's a set of equations that go back and forth between them, right? So be able to do that. And be able and use these kind of, and be able to do calculations like I did right here. I mean, given a certain input and output configuration, what is the gain that you might see at one of these voltage points here? So this is a composite of both common mode and differential mode input. You figure out what the two parts are, you multiply it by the appropriate gain, common mode or differential mode gain, and then you can figure out what the, what the voltage is at either one of these outputs by using the proper change of variables back again. Okay, So that's a pretty typical problem. Um, <coughs> Com mode operation. I think you know all of this stuff. Um, okay, so that so that's differential pairs. So differential pairs, com mode. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm just going to roll on. If you have any questions, stop me. I'll, I'll happily uh, ask, answer stuff. Okay, so here we go to current sources. Okay. Clearly, you know what current sources are, how to calculate I ref, how to calculate, um, you know, given an output current, what is I ref, given I a circuit, what is I out? Be able to go back and forth. Um, 
important thing about current sources is what is the signals, the voltage swing you can have on the output drain, you know, the output of the current source. How how much voltage, how high can you go and how low can you go before some device goes out of satur goes out of saturation. For this problem, of course, it can go all the way up to the supply, but it gets within one VD sat of ground, and then you get in trouble with this transistor. It goes in linear region. So we need to know this ex these regions of operation. Uh, question? Yes. Do we need to know the uh, BJT stuff? Yes. Okay, I'll show you some of the BJT. Yeah, for the I'll do those in a second. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, here's for the cascode source, for example. In, in, in office hours, they had several times we talked about what transistor goes in linear region first. Basically, you start where, where the voltage that you're thinking about, and then go to the transistors that are connected to that, okay? Because those are almost surely the ones that will first go into linear region operation. So for this circuit, here's the output. Let's say, what is the swing we have in the output of this current source? Well, the first transistor that's going to go into linear region operation is M2. Okay? When you go around and you figure out, you know, up through this, VGS, we know. We know what VGSs are, so we go march up this VGS, this VGS, and down this VGS. So we figure out what this voltage is. Then we can figure out what voltage swing we can have on this. We can get within one VD sat of that voltage. Now, as soon as we get below a VD sat away from this voltage, this device goes into linear region operation. Then this node begins to control this voltage, not this path here. Okay, so once this goes out of linear region operation, this VGS is no longer equal to VT plus VD sat. And then, therefore, you have to figure out what controls that voltage. Well, what controls it then is this voltage up here. It's kind of a voltage divider between a resistor and this R out of this device here. So this voltage begins to control that voltage. And so then what happens is you de continue to decrease this output voltage. This transistor goes into linear region operation. Okay? So it starts off with this one first. It goes linear. Then this voltage here begins to control this because the VGS is no longer equal to VT plus VD sat. And then the, you begin to have this one go into linear region operation. That will happen, of course, when this gets within one, when this voltage gets within one VD sat of the ground. Okay? That just shows it there. Does the same thing happen to the other branch? Okay, what the other branch? Okay, let's look at that. So what happens in the other branch? The other branch is just a bias string, right? So there's no signals on this other branch. So these devices basically just work merrily along, generating two nice voltages here for these transistors over here. And those voltages will never change, right? There's no, there's no connection between this output and these transistors over here, right? So this, this, these voltages will always stay the same, no matter what happens to this voltage. Right? It's only this side that changes, OK? See that? These are connected to gates, right? So there's nothing connected there, right? There's nothing. There's no way that this this voltage here has any effect on this swing, this, this bias string over here. Okay. Uh, okay. Are out. Be able to calculate. Just keep you know cascading these things. You know, just every time you, it's basically what you're doing is making the equivalent circuit. I mean, here's the problem we solve. You have a, if you have a source resistance and you're looking into the drain, we know the answer to that. So we're making this, this source resistance was actually just an equivalent resistance looking downwards. And looking downwards for this circuit was looking into the drain of M1. So looking into the drain of M1, we say, OK, what can we replace that transistor with? We can replace it simply with a resistor of size R0. And then we can. We can look at it like this. We don't have to worry about the fact that it's a cascode anymore. It's just a good old common source degeneration, and we know the answer to that. You know this answer right up here. Okay. And if we want to do it again, we just so we know the equivalent resistance looking here. It's R zero. We know the equivalent resistance looking here. It's G M R not squared. So then we can just replace all of this by a resistor of size G M R not squared, and use the same old equation again. And that's when we finally end up with this. Okay. So that's. The idea of equivalent resistance is really important because it gets, allows you to just reduce the circuit, make it a lot simpler to look at. And the high swing idea, pretty important. 
you have a cascode like this, high swing means you want to have this transistor, the lower one, right at the edge of saturation, because having it higher than the edge of saturation only degrades the output swing that we see on the drain of this other transistor. So we try to reduce this voltage to as low a voltage as we possibly can, which is 1 VD sat above the ground. For this case here, you know, for example, what, what's the voltage at this point right here? What's the minimum swing we can get on this one? 1 VT plus VD sat, another VT plus another VD sat, another VT plus another VD sat. So it's 3 VT plus 3 VD sats to this point. Down a VT plus a VD sat, so a 2 VT plus 2 VD sats here. So we have to go up another one, so it's 2 VT plus 3 VD sats is the minimum voltage we can have at this point. So wow, that's pretty high. You should always be able, the high swing idea is if you've got a string of transistors like this, you should be able to have a bias string, a bias string that allows you to only require 3 VD sat, be able to get within 3 dB sats this voltage. And the way you do that is, of course, by offsetting these voltages that drive these gates by putting a little battery in series. And that's what this was all about, right? This is just one cascode, right? But instead of this, if this voltage were 2 VT plus 2 VD sat, if I didn't have this battery here, this voltage would be at a VT plus a VD sat here. So it's an extra VT sitting there. So we can just cancel that off by putting a little battery in that sort of subtracts it off. It gets us down to VD sat. So this guy is still in saturation, but at the very edge, that's fine. The edge is just fine right there. There's no extra voltage being used here to just drive this deep into saturation. There's no advantage of that. So this is the high swing idea that you get things biased so right at the edge of saturation, and that's really important for these low voltage circuits that we have to deal with. Okay, how to implement battery? You can AC couple it. That's the old way of doing it. When you, people used to do discrete transistor circuits, or discrete, you know, build things up of little boards and little transistors, you use this approach because a capacitor was, you could have any size capacitor you want. You make that a microfarad. You can't do that on a chip. And so we have to direct couple everything. We have to put little battery offsets to make this work. And this is one way to do it. There's other ways to do it as well. But this is the most straightforward one. It just you put a little source follower in there and it acts like a little VT plus VD sat drop across this transistor right here. So this is just a biased current source for this source follower. And this source follower in the center is just acting like a little battery. Okay. And that sets this voltage here exactly at the right voltage we want, which is one VD sat above ground, and we get the high swing condition. Any question about that? That's really pretty important stuff there. Okay, that, that's uh, any question about that. It's a mixing of an it's mixing of the small signal and large signal. That's what's made a little confusing about it because we're sort of doing small signal design, but we're looking at the where the we're looking where the region of operation where the small signal model is breaking down. Our small signal model is usually is based around everything being in saturation. We're looking to see where that model breaks down. Where we, that's what we say when we say the region of operation where this device changes into linear region, we're saying what's happening is the region of operation is different now. And our old model, the one that gives us GMRO and all the equations we used, are no longer valid. So that's, what, that's it's kind of coupling those two worlds together. Wilson source, this is this little feedback circuit. You should understand. Be able to recognize this. OK, if I draw it down there, Every time I do this, there'll be some percentage of you who will not recognize this as a Wilson source and come up with some strange answer. You just need a pattern match, okay? You see this diode connection here? You see a transistor here that goes into this diode connection? Hmm, that's kind of weird. Well, what's going on here? Well, it feeds back over here. Oh, that's a Wilson source. Okay, you should be able to do that, right? Okay, be able to just look at that and flip it upside down, turn it sideways. I mean, I should be, I, you should be able to recognize that topology no matter what configuration it's in, OK? I won't always draw it like that, right? And this is that little analysis of it. There's two analysis of this in the notes. Forget the first one. They're both the similar. The only difference is that I drop this one over GM. That's the, that's the difference between the two analyses. But it just gives a little bit small, very minor difference in the answer. But don't be confused by that. OK. Here's a second analysis. I did it again, right? To match, if we really want to make sure the VDSs are all the same, we put this extra transistor in. So here's another circuit to 
pattern match, right? Putting this extra does that this transistor does nothing else than keep the VDSs of these two transistors exactly the same. If you want to really match this current with this current, you want to have everything, all the VDSs the same. Not only WL is the same, but all the VDS is the same. And this this putting this transistor here keeps the VDSs of these two transistors exactly the same, which makes these two currents closer. Here's the di the bipolar when you talked about. You should understand the Widlar source. It's very useful sometimes for doing very low currents. So if I give you this problem, you should be able to analyze, you know, what the resist what the current will be given a certain size resistor and you know a certain reference current or what's the reference current with this resistor to give you this output current and so on. So be able to go through the design equations of this. Here's another one. Should be able to do that. Supply and bising. That's this trick about where we have these two, this upper pair of transistors, which are a current mirror, which drive this lower set of transistors. And it ends up with a curve like this. So this is the upper transistor, which gives us this I ref equals I, I right equals I left current. And we have that lower circuit, which looks like this. And there's two operating points, one where they two cross up here, which is the value we want, others at zero. We talked about this um, having to have a little offset of the left versus right current of this upper mirror so that we only have one operating point. And this is a startup problem. You okay, should be able to recognize what a startup circuit looks like, or probably won't ask you to do one because that would be a design problem, which is too hard to grade. But um, OK, supply. here's another example. This is, so just two or three examples of the supply independent bias circuits. Let me just say something. The note, the if it's not something we covered in a homework exam, if it's not something I covered in lecture, if it's not something we covered in discussion with the TAs, it won't be on the exam. So you don't have to worry about material in the book that was not covered in class or in discussion or in a homework. Okay, so that's a little simplification for you, maybe. Uh, you can cascode these upper current source just like we did, you know, cascoding the ones before. So you could use high swing up here. There's lots of different things you could do. Just so it's this is just a current mirror, and it it's, acts like a current source. So you could do all the same techniques we use for regular current sources. Then we talk about using it as a load. That's the big a a way we get large gain MOS because current MOS really does have good current sources. It doesn't have very good GM, but it sure has good current sources. And so you can use that to get high output resistance, which allows a high gain. So that's what we use very often. We use, use current sources as our loads for our gain stages. And we finally end up with this differential pair with a current source load. <coughs> and that's a very commonly used circuit that's a very differential single ended conversion. We went through all the equations on how that worked. You should know the answers to that and be able to calculate that. And you can cascode. This upper transistor, and you can cascode this lower pair of transistors, and that was that telescopic transistor I talked, telescopic stage I talked about. And you can fold it over, and that was that folded cascode we talked about. Okay, there you go. Any questions about that? Back. Uh, where's next? Let's see. Alpha stages. Okay, um, output stages. We calculate something new here. We calculate this, uh, what we call efficiency. Efficiency is the maximum power in the load over the power dissipated from the sources. Okay, and so the maximum power in the load obviously is very much a function of the output swing. So design of these stages, you want to maximize the output swing because that gives you more power into the load. And for class A stages, the sets the power into the, from the sources is independent of the swing. If you have a small swing, you really lose badly. Okay, okay. So we talked about this is a class A stage where there's always current flowing, no matter what the input is. At zero bias, we have lots of current. And I talked a little bit as a set of design equations here for that. Um, for this case. 
where I included the power of the bias circuit. You guys asked to be very clear what I include. There's 4 IQ going in at the maximum positive voltage, 2 IQ and the minimum voltage, and there's, I guess, 3 IQ on, when we have zero input, right? That's because I'm including that bias string here. Often you don't do that. You make the bias string have low current, so that's why it doesn't count that much. Then we calculate what the power efficiency is, you know. It's peak voltage, and the power into load is peak voltage times the current times one half, because you, you calculate the RMS value. And we just did some calculations here. Swing, et cetera. Here's a bipolar version. Bipolar version is generally a little bit better because you can get a lot more. You can get this voltage can get a lot bigger swing, you can be a lot closer to the supply, because bipolar transistors can supply a lot more current. What happens when we try to supply a lot of current in an MOS device? That VD sat gets really big, right? That VD sat getting really big s reduces the swing that we can have on this output, makes the stage less efficient. So we can make MOS have the low VD sat by making this transistor get bigger and bigger. And you guys saw what happens when you how big this thing can get. Even for one kilo ohm, that transistor gets pretty big, right? You try to drive 50 ohms, you can imagine how big this guy gets, right? And so that's a real problem with MOS. That it's just that it, the fact that VD sat is getting large is just another way of saying that MOS has a lot of trouble of supplying a lot of current. Okay, bipolar gives you a lot more current with less voltage. It has that exponential characteristic, right? So it really is better. Uh, question: yes. How does the bipolar area compared to the MOS with the same feature? Bi MOS is generally a lot smaller because bipolar you have to isolate each transistor because you have these forward bias, the base emitter diodes forward biased, right? That's how, that's how bipolar circuits work. So you've got to isolate that transistor. It has to be like in a well in effect, right? So you think about every, if every transistor, MOS transistor, was in its own private well, you're kind of getting like a bipolar device. So that's a big problem, right? And so MOS is much more dense, and that's why it's the that's why bipolar just didn't make it when digital design needed such density. MOS just won. You know, I mean, there was there, there was a battle, you know, 15 years ago, I don't know, 20 years ago, and the bipolar guys kept you know fighting for life, right? Oh, we got a new technique, it's I squared L. We got another one. You know, this is going to you know, compete with MOS. And they just kept trying and kept trying. But then the next generation of MOS would come along, knock out that set of bipolar, and those guys would go off and try to do something new again, right? So it just, that kind of went on for a few years, and everybody just gave up finally. So <laughs> bottom line is MOS is just too dense. Okay. And in spite of the fact that bipolar is easier to do analog circuits with bipolar. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a simpler task. Bigger voltage swings, more current, bigger G sub M's, all sorts of nice stuff. Unfortunately, those days are gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the swing, different regions of operation. Okay, uh, we'll be very clear what we ask for. If we say the output swing of a common source stage like that, we will be very clear what we mean. We'll say, what is the maximum swing or minimum swing you can have where all devices are in saturation? That'll probably be the kind of question we might ask. Okay, push-pull circuits. Um, we haven't. We've. Uh, we've on the projects. We've run your um, designs through our test benches and seeing what you did. Unfortunately, I don't have the average values of figure merits and stuff like that for you. We'll get that very soon. Next Monday, I guess we'll do it. Um, but bottom line is, you guys did pretty good. Most people were able to meet more, all the specifications, so most of the designs are well. So I'm going to I'm going to grade the. You know, it's pretty much. You know, wrote. You know, did you meet the specs or did not meet the specs? That's pretty clear cut. You know, yes, no decision. I'm going to grade how well you wrote the projects. I will tell you. If you have 10 or 15 pages of, you know, text for me to read, I get more and more upset as I read more and more pages. <laughs> so, like I said, concise and clear and easy to read is what I want to have. And so you, some of you did, got carried away with 
verbosity and I'm going to going to lose a few points. Not a lot, but you know, I'll make the point. You know, so next time you won't do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Push B. Uh, class B. Push pull circuits. The reason I jumped over to the project stuff. Where did that come from? Right. Was uh, some of you use class B output stages? Okay. Which is actually a pretty smart thing to do because the test benches only looked at the DC current, you know, at around the nominal operating point. So the output stage had no current going through it at zero output volts, right? So the figure merit for those designs is really good, right? <laughs> so that, that was a pretty good idea. So I mean, don't worry if you didn't do that. I think it was a it was a clever idea, and we'll reward it appropriately. But we won't make all everybody's figure merit bad just because you didn't use that techniques. We'll just look at the two sets of figures of merits. But so it was a good idea though. But see that that's good thinking. That's exactly I mean hey, geez, you just can't get below having a half have you know two milliamps going through that upper transistor and that's going to make the size of that transistor really big and the power dissipation is going to be really bad. But there is a solution for the current to be almost zero on that output stage, right? And so the power will be a lot lower from that, at least from our um, which is using class B stage. Now we hadn't done class B yet. So those people were reading ahead, which is fair game. I mean, uh, it's, you don't have to be controlled by what I've told you. But, but don't worry. If you didn't do that, we won't, I won't penalize you that much. I won't penalize you at all. I'll just reward the other people. OK, so push-pull circuits. Uh, um, know that, remember, it's, it's, this is the formula. You have to enter the, the current from the supplies is proportional to the power going into the load. So it's a much more efficient stage. And this can get up to like 80%. Right. You know, if the swing is equal to the supply. Okay. Question about that? How are we going? We're down to op amps. Um, know this baby, right? Uh, it's a basic amplifier, multi-stage, you know, differential pair with current source load. This is kind of the workhorse. Uh, uh, amplifier, and we'll be using it later on in the semester, looking at stability of it and so on. And there's a third stage potentially could be connected here, an output stage as well, right? And so that's the, a very typical op amp is a differential input stage, differential single to conversion, a gain stage, and then an output stage. That's typically what op amp looks like. Oops. And did all sorts of analysis of this thing. Should know voltage into slide. That's a very important slide. So know this one, right? <laughs> okay. How you connect these things up? Okay. This business about you know the uh, matching voltage. If the currents are the same, the transistors are the same, then the voltages will be all the same. So that this this sort of uh, way to figure out what voltages are. We probably won't do anything with sizing resistors and stuff. Okay. Okay, getting close to the end here. Um, let's see, telescopic. This is the last thing we did. Uh, and this is, I gave you a couple of, the important thing about this little exercise that I went through here with bad biases and different kind of bias strings, the thing you should be able to do, and we're going to make sure you know how to do it, we're going to test that you know how to do it, is what's the swing that you can get on these nodes? What's the, given the input voltage, what's the output swing you can get? What's the input swing? What's the common mode range that you have in these circuits? So that's the sort of the DC biasing part of the problem. And what's regions of operation? I mentioned that before. And of course, in these kind of circuits, it's even more complicated. You should be able to do that. What, what, and of course, figure out gains and big G sub M and you know, the s typical two port parameters as well. Okay, and then we talked about you know, a little bit better biasing strategy. Should be able to anal analyze these kinds of things. Okay, and then this folding. You know how to analyze a folded cascode circuit. What the regions of operation? How far the swing can happen? What's the common mode range on the input? What's the you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and how you turn this into, be able to analyze, I showed a high swing configuration of this, right? And be able to analyze this uh, high swing configuration and how well, how big things can swing in this and what the currents are and so on. So you should be able to analyze these. These high these are these are work, I mean, this is the same old transistor, it's a good old differential pair with current source load. 
But now we've just put high swing on it, we folded it over so we get better output range and so on. So it's all the same core circuit there. So you should understand how that works and how to design it and analyze it. And that's it. Jeez, hardly any material here to cover. All right, so. <laughs> okay, so any uh, questions about that? I, unfortunately, or fortunately, will not be here Wednesday. I leave um, for a flight Monday afternoon, but I will have extra office hours on Monday, okay? So I'll have office hours beforehand like normal, but I'll go af off to my office after class on Monday, and I'll be there from till I have to leave the airport probably at 2. So I'll, uh, two, maybe quarter to 2. So I'll leave the airport at quarter to two. So I can, I'll be in office hours from 12:30 to quarter to two on Monday. So if you want, to come by and ask questions and stuff. We can. I'll be happy to go over any of this material. Because I want you to do well on this midterm, right? Everybody's going to do a great job on it, right? So no reason not to. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Switch the brain. Okay, frequency response. <laughs> All right. So um, I started last time was talking about Bode plots, and I had some requests to um, uh, go slow. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to go slow. So um, I'll go slow by doing examples. Okay. Um, so let's start off with analyzing. Probably the simplest circuit that we can deal with. Good old RC circuit. It, uh, the same situation is going to happen with these RC circuits I'm talking about right now that will happen with our single transistor circuits. There will be a few of these configurations that we'll use over and over again. We won't have real complicated RC networks. I mean, they'll primarily be something like this, okay, or maybe slight. You know variations of this. Okay, so you just know these really simple RC circuits hold, right? You should just know the answers just right away in the other versions of it, and then just make life a lot easier for yourself, right? Okay. All right. So what we need to calculate of this is the new problem we're going to work with now is the frequency, v out over V in as a function of the frequency, a sine wave into this thing, right? So the question is, how do you calculate, and there's a phase and magnitude variation from the output to the input that happens when you go through this network. And the amplitude will decrease, because this is a passive circuit, so the amplitude will get less. And it'll be phase shifted, it'll be shifted in time. The sine wave, which starts off with a T equals zero here, will be, you know, have a little bit of zero be moved over a little bit, okay? You might think, why is that so important? Okay, you know, why do we care just a little time shift? Here's why. Let me just give you a little motivation. What happens if the time shift happens to be one half of a period? Then what the time shift is? So this is t. This is zero degrees phase shift. This is like I don't know what it is, but this one here is going to be like. This is like 90 degrees of phase shift, and this is like 180 degrees of phase shift. 180 degrees looks like this. What's the relationship of this to this? Yes. You can't see. You can know. I can see it. <laughs> okay. So zero to 180. What's the relationship from this to this? Negative. It's like a gain of minus one, right? Now, think about this. You've got a little op amp. And you've gone through and you've figured out what the minus input and the plus input is, and you put this thing into feedback. Okay, and we put our V in here and we have our V out here. What happens if there is 180 degrees of phase shift through this amplifier? So we get an extra minus one that we have relative to what we have at zero degree, at, at low frequency. What's going to happen is, instead of this being minus and plus, if we got an extra 180 degrees of phase shift, 
this will now go into being plus, and this will now go into being minus. What do we have now? We have a circuit now that has positive feedback. Positive feedback is an oscillator, right? Positive feedback doesn't work if you want to have nice controlled values of gain. Something like this would oscillate. In fact, if it at the lowest frequency, it, in fact, what we figure out how you make an oscillator is you put something into positive feedback and the frequency at what the phase shifts minus one is where the thing will oscillate at. So if you want to make oscillators, you want to have positive feedback. If you want to have amplifiers and controlled amplifiers, you want negative feedback. So you can see a big problem here. That's why phase shift is so important to us. We, we're going to have to figure out how to control or understand what the phase shift of these amplifiers are and control the gain in such a way that this circle will stay stable. And I'll give you the answer. Here's how you make this work. We're always going to have at least 180 degrees of phase shift. In fact, we're going to have 360. We'll have 540 degrees. You have, every time you have a stage, or you'll have another 190 degrees of phase shift. Okay? How can you ever make anything work is maybe more of the question. Here's the answer. And this is what we're going to do when we, later on in the year. We will have to kill the gain of the amplifier so that at the frequency where the phase shifts 180 degrees, the first time it occurs, the gain will have to be less than 1. So in other words, you can have positive feedback if the gain is less than 1. Now, just think about, just to get you used to this, this is jumping way ahead now, but I'm just giving you so you get this in your heads. We work to have this gain of a million, right? We like to have high gain. We've been working like that like crazy to have stages with lots of gain. Now I'm telling you, we're going to have to figure out when the phase shift occurs 180 degrees, we're going to have to kill all of that gain. We're going to have to get that gain from 10 to the 6th down to 1 at the frequencies where the phase shift is equal to 180 degrees. That's the stability problem. That's called compensation. And that's what we'll do after we do feedback, OK? But you can see this is all tied up with this phase shift stuff and this amplitude business. The way we'll kill the gain is we'll use RC-like circuits. OK, but you can imagine it's, you've got to go a long ways to do this. So it's going to be difficult how to do this, yeah. Pardon? The open loop gain. The open loop gain. So we're talking about the gain before you do the feedback. OK, so we'll have to have that. Okay, so that's okay. So motivation, phase shift and amplitude variation of these circuits is very important to us. So let's, how do we analyze it? So let's go back and since so I've fouled up that page, I'll do it again. Okay, now, so how do we calculate this h of omega? So what I said was we use phasor analysis. We use impedances. We move to that domain. Okay, and so. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c, where j is a 90 degrees phase shift. So we have to, we can then, once we sort of work with impedances, we can just use our same old KCL and KVL equations, right? And so V out of this circuit is equal to V in of omega times the voltage divider here. And the voltage divider here is 1 over j omega c over R plus 1 over j omega c. And it's just like you know, voltage divider we had with, this is ZC and this is ZR, right? ZR. This is VN, this is V out, right? So these are complex imp impedances now. So, but they handle, they're, they're analyzed just like the resistances, right? So this is our, and so th this voltage divider, pretty trivial calculation, is the transfer function. So V out over VN equals H of omega, right? It's going to be equal to this. So this is h of omega. Now, how do we work with this? So, so let's first let's let's simplify it so it doesn't have all these you know denominators. So we multiply top and bottom by j omega c. So we end up with one plus r j I'm sorry j omega r c. Okay. So this is the basic form of what we call a single pole response, okay? And a single pole response, if we plot the magnitude and phase of this, which now which I'm going to do, so to calculate the magnitude, h of omega 
is equal to h of omega times h of omega complex conjugate square root of the whole thing. Okay? So it's 1 over 1 plus j omega rc. We're trying to get magnitude of h of omega now. Times com that complex conjugate, which is just take all the j's and put them in the minus j. Take the square root of the whole thing. Multiply this out, we get 1 over 1 plus omega rc squared, okay, square root, okay. Plot this. It looks like this. And the break point of this thing, the point where it's point where magnitude of h of omega is at 1 right here, starts, if we go to this low frequency, <coughs> so the important thing is check the limits. Let omega go to 0. Omega to 0, we used to end up with 1. So this starts off with, this is magnitude of h of omega. So at low frequency, it's 1. At the point where omega equals 1 over rc, <coughs> excuse me, wow, geez. we call this the omega 3 dB point. Mm. <coughs> wow, okay. Um, okay, that's this point here. And this point right here, it's going to be at 0.707. It's 1 over root 2 times the psi, times the low frequency value. If we do that in, uh, this is a voltage ratio, so if we take 20 log of 0.707, we end up with this being equal to minus 3 dB. Okay? So this we call as the mega 3 dB point. Okay? I'll also call this the pole frequency. So by definition. And the pole frequency is coming because I'm thinking about Laplace transform domain. So I'll go back and do that a little bit later on. But I'll, so I, if, I, if I call this a pole frequency or 3 dB frequency, I mean the same thing. Okay? Now, we approximate this. Instead of having this exact curve here, we don't really need it that accurately. So what we're going to do is do a piecewise linear approximation. So instead of having it like this, here's the approximation we're going to make. Straight until the, this 3 dB frequency, and then fall off. The, the, the fall off rate here, what is this, what, what's, what is the slope of this? If we look at this equation right here, we go to very large omega greater than RC. Remember? 3 dB frequency is 1 over RC, so we rewrite this as 1 over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB, quantity squared, all square root. As we go to omega very large, this is greater than 1, then we end up with this reducing to be the square root of that. So out here, this goes as omega 3 dB over omega. All right? Because the square, square root takes care of the square. So in other words, at omega equal omega 3 dB, this value is 1. So that's kind of our piecewise linear approximation. And then it falls off inversely proportional to frequency. That's the thing to remember. So if you have a single pole response, a response that only has one of these kinds of factors, the, the, ro the roll-off of this thing is inversely proportional frequency. So if you know the gain here is, at, is 1, what's the gain at 74 times higher frequency? What, what is the gain at 74 times omega 3 dB? 1 over 74, right? Very easy answer. I mean, don't get all fouled up with dB and 10 dB, 20 dB per roll off. Just remember that this thing falls off inversely proportional with frequency if there's only one factor, if it's only one pole. Okay? Ten times higher frequency, ten times lower gain if you're up in this region here. Okay? Let's remember. Okay. Um, what about phase shift? Okay, let's talk about phase shift. I mean, probably, I almost hate to do this, and that's. Um, <laughs> uh, 
we generally work with this in DB, and that's what's kind of confusing, right? We, we generally plot this on a log scale, okay? So we're plotting this on log scale. This is like 20 times the log of this magnitude of h of omega. Then this slope on log scale, okay, this thing falls off at 20 dB per decade. Well, what's that mean? That means you fall off t a factor of 10, and decade is a 10 times in frequency. So this just means 10 times drop and 10 times frequency, but it's 20 dB, which is a factor of 10 in dB, right? Or 6 dB per octave. 6 dB means a factor of 2 reduced for a factor of 2 change in, amp in frequency. So it's just all the same thing. So don't get fouled up with this dB stuff. Just remember this. It's the inverse proportional frequency when you're up high like this. Okay. If I had you calculate, what happens if you go 74 times higher in frequency, what's the fall off? And you went over to dB to calculate you know, this in frequency, you can see how complicated it can get, right? Just don't do it that way. Just keep remembering the fact working just 10 times, 10 times higher or 74 times higher or 74 times less gain. Okay. That's half of it. H of omega, what we're really doing here is going to polar coordinates. We're going to H of omega, the magnitude of it, and then the rest of it is the phase shift. And the way we deal with the phase shift is polar coordinate. So this is, you know, this basically is a, this is a rectangular. If we have, this is equal to H real plus J H imaginary. That's what so we need to go from this rectangular coordinate system into this polar coordinate system. That's kind of what we're doing. So the magnitude is basically the magnitude of this, of this phasor, right? Now we need to calculate the theta of omega. That's the other part, okay? How do we calculate that? Well, if you remember from your complex variable theory or wherever you did it, right? This is simply the arc tangent, okay, of the imaginary hi of omega over h real of omega. Okay? So it's basically the ratio of the imaginary part to the real part. Okay? And I can rewrite this as the imaginary part of h of omega over the real part of h of omega. All right? Now the question is how do you do that? So you're given a transfer function like we have, so let me calculate theta of omega now. Let me, oh God, theta of omega, we said, is equal to arc tangent of h i of omega, the imaginary part, over h real of omega. Okay? h of omega is equal to 1 over 1 plus j omega over omega 3 dB. Okay? It's a single pole response. What's h i of omega equal to. The way you do that is you've got to multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the bottom, right? So you multiply this by 1 minus j omega over omega 3 dB. You multiply this by 1 minus j omega over omega 3 dB. This gives you 1 minus j omega over omega 3 dB over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB quantity squared. Now we have hi is equal to minus omega over omega 3 dB over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB quantity squared and h real is equal to 1 over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB quantity squared. Theta equals the arc tangent of all this stuff. So it's this over this. You can sort of see the denominators the same. So you end up with this being arc tangent of minus omega over omega 3 dB, which is equal to minus the arc tangent of omega over omega 3 dB. So let's plot that. The arc tangent. It's going always going negative. So we start off at zero degrees. Omega equals zero. The arc tangent of that is zero degrees. At omega equal to omega three dB, this is the arc tangent of minus one. So that'll be what? That'll be minus forty-five degrees. So at 
omega equal to omega 3 dB, the phase shift's 45 degrees. And this is an arc tangent curve. And then at very high frequency, it's at minus 90 degrees. Well, this is a mess. This is an arc tangent curve. We don't want to work with that. Okay? So we piecewise linear approximate this. What's our piecewise linear approximation? Our piecewise linear approximation is at 10 times below this frequency, 0 0.1 omega 3 dB, we start a linear curve. Okay? And at 10 times above, we finish the linear curve at minus 90 degrees. So our piecewise linear approximation will be something that goes from 0 at 1 over a factor of 100 in frequency will go from 0 degrees to minus 90 degrees. OK? Now notice what's happening here. We, now we put these two curves together. So let me do that. So we have our magnitude plot. Our piecewise linear plot looks like this. This is magnitude of h of omega. All right. Here's a 3 dB point, and here's theta of omega. This is minus 45 degrees, minus 90 degrees. Notice what's happening here. The magnitude is not changing at all, but the phase shift has gone through 45 degrees. So the phase shift starts kind of hidden, right? You don't see any magnitude change, but you're getting phase shift. Then after you hit that phase shift at exactly at that pole point where the amplitude begins to decrease, we have minus 45 degrees of phase shift. And then as we go up to higher and higher frequency and up around 10 degrees, 10 times higher than the omega 3 dB point, this is omega 3 dB. This is 0.1 omega 3 dB. We have up to minus 90 degrees of phase shift. This is the really important result. This is going to be something. And in, in, the nice thing about this, as we'll see, we can easily go from this to multipole responses and multi-zero responses and so on. This is Bode plots. We call these are Bode plots. This is in, if we're plotting this in dB, this is in log scale here. And this is in log scale in this direction. This is in linear scale in this direction. These are what we call Bode plots, right? The right, important thing about these is it's from these plots that we'll do the calculations for stability. So that's why it's important to be able to do these things. It's because we'll use directly these plots when we do our compensation calculations to figure out if a circuit's really stable or not, if it's going to oscillate. Okay? Any questions about that? So I went that in gory detail. Now I'll begin to fly. <laughs> The error is actually quite small. Let me just say that. The error from this linear approximation is only a few degrees. So it's actually not very big. Yeah. Can you go back, I think, three sheets? Three sheets. This one? <laughs> Stay there. Okay. Any questions about that? Happy to answer. If you want to slow me down, someone in the office hours of the day said, Boy, would you slow down? And I go, no problem. I'll happily slow down. The only thing you have to do is just ask me a question. <laughs> but, uh, and I'll gladly slow down and... Got a question? No, no, no question. All right. That means I go, okay? And no questions, I go. <laughs> okay. All right. Buddy plots. We just did all this stuff. Okay. That's what I just did. See? We went faster here. Okay, so now... <laughs> Let's do two poles. Let's catch up here. Let's, can you move the camera here? Move the camera. Someone tapped the door there, I think. Tap the glass there. <laughs> I think he's staying for midterms too, right? So, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, let's say you have two responses two single pole responses with a buffer between. How would we analyze this? And this is where the big wind comes with the Bode plot analysis. It turns out using the, the way we've done this, it becomes very trivial to go to multipole responses and zeros as we'll see in a second. 
Why is that? If you think about the magnitude, okay, we go to dB on this thing, so it's 20 times the log, and that's what we were plotting, right? We're plotting the, um, the, the dB curve here, right? Let's call this, we know the answer to this one here, it's 1 over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB quantity squared to the 1 half, right? Let's call that H1 of omega, okay, in the magnitude. Let's call the same thing here H2 of omega, magnitude. Clearly, the V out over V in of this thing is equal to, defined as H of omega complex conjugate, which is going to be equal to the magnitude of H1 of omega times H2 of omega. Right? Because V, we call this V1. You know, this is V in over, or V1 over V in is equal to H1, right? H2 is V out over V1. H1 times H2, the two V1s will cancel, you get V out over V in. So this is clearly true. If we go to 20 log of this, which is what our plots are, what do we have? It's going to be the 20 log of H1 of omega plus 20 log of H2 of omega will be equal to, you know, H of omega in dB, right? So it's the sum of the individual transfer functions. So all we have to do when we do two responses like this is add the two, two of them together. So let me just do that. So here's H1 of omega, let's call this, and this starts at 0 dB, right? Because it starts off with 20 log of 1, which is 0 dB. So this is H1 of omega. And let me do color code here. Here's H2, okay, magnitude, all right? So what's the composite response? What's H omega? Because that's really what we want, okay? Multimedia. Okay, so H of omega. Okay. We add zero to zero, you get zero. This starts to be going going lower. It's falling off at this 6 dB per octave thing or you know inverse proportional of frequency. Okay. So plus zero, so that means we're just gonna follow this curve. Because there's a zero here. When we get out to the second curve, now we have both of these things added together, so it's falling off even faster. This is falling off at 1 over omega. What's it falling off with out, right out here? 1 over 2 omega? Squared? Cubic? Square root? Log? <laughs> or omega squared, right? Because it's two transfer functions multiplied times each other, right? So it's 1 over... 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB 1 times square square root 1 over 1 plus omega over omega 3 dB 2 squared square root. Get the two ones out of the way. Take the square root of what's left over. This ends up going as omega 3 dB 1 times omega 3 dB 2 over omega squared. So this falls off like 1 over omega squared, which is also 12 dB per octave, minus 12 dB per octave, or minus 40 dB per decade. And this is 6 dB per octave, right? But I'd say keep track of the omegas. Every time you go through another pole, it goes up squared, cube, or through, and so on. So that's really neat. So all you do is get the transfer functions and just add them together and you can get the more complicated one. And with this piecewise linear stuff, you can see how easy it is to sketch down complicated transfer functions. Okay, what about the phase shift? How does that work? Well, remember, let's go back to our phasor analysis thing. We have H1 of omega times H2 of omega. Let's, 
as, as we said, we can break this up into two parts, right? So it's the com it's the magnitude of h1 times h2 times e to the j theta one of omega plus theta two of omega, right? Because remember, h, it's h times e to the j omega and or j theta, and the two thetas will just add together. So again, the phase shifts also just add when in these Bode plots. So in other words, so let's do it. Let's do our same thing we did before. So let's start off with black. Okay. Start off with black, and so black for zero degrees, and this is for h1 of omega, and at ten times below omega three one tenth of omega three dB one. We start to roll off. We're at minus 45 degrees at omega 3 dB 1. And at 10 times, we're at minus 90 degrees. OK? So this is 10 times omega 3 dB 1. And let's say out here we start point 0.1 of omega 3 dB 2. Okay, now I, I should do my blue. So blue, we start at 10 times. We start at minus 45. We're at omega 3 dB2. And at 10 times, we're at minus 90 degrees. We just simply have to add them together to get the transfer the phase shift of the full H of omega. So what do we do? We just take zero. This is all zero degrees here for the first one. So we just map out this green before, right? So we go green. We follow this one down. This period here just stays the same for a while. Now we start adding this one because this is just zero degrees, right? Now we start adding in the second one. And it goes down like this, like I already drew for you, right? You know, the first one actually went off like this. The first one went like here. So. So here, the green one is the composite of the two. And at 10 times above, we're, so this goes to minus 135 degrees. And here's minus 180. So that's that magical point. So two poles give you 180 degrees of phase shift. Bam, we've taken something that was positive gain to negative gain. So all you need to have is two pole responses inside that whole op amp. And you easily get that. Okay. Any question about that? Uh, is it possible to have the uh, omega 3db2 overlap with omega 3db1? Absolutely. And so what happens if they're right on top of each other? So it's it just like the amplitude body part, just add on it? It just adds. It just adds. See, theta, theta's just add, right? So this is the theta of omega of the composite thing. It's the two just added together. So yeah, so what happens if they're right on top of each other? That's a good question. What's the magnitude response going to look like? It's going to start falling off as 1 over omega squared right at that omega 3 dB point, right? It'll just immediately fall off. You won't see two breakpoints. What will the phase shifts do? At 10 times below, it'll start down at, at the 3 dB frequency, it'll be minus what? Minus 90 degrees. And at 10 times above, it'll be minus 180. Going to overlap by 0.1 percent. <laughs> yeah, you can see overlapping directly is easy. Separate apart is easy. When they're not either one of those, it's not so easy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so sometimes you have to sort of. But you can get the idea. I mean, generally we try to have things widely. Often they're widely separated, or we can approximate them as being on top of each other. But you can sort of see other cases that are pretty easy to analyze, right? I mean, what happens if this was at, um, let's say, omega 3 dB2 was right at 10 times omega 3 dB1? So you can figure out that point, right? So you get 90 degrees from 1, and you get 45 from the second one, so it be a minus 135 degrees at that point, right? And so you can sort of do some piecewise linear stuff there, right? So. 
Okay. If you, sometimes you may have to go all the way back to calculating using the arctangent thing, but not very often, very rarely. So here's my little analysis I already showed you. Oh, here's, in fact, we even, okay, let's do another one. Three on top of each other. <laughs> what happens then, right? Often we write this in, um, <laughs> what do you call this? Uh, not degree, radians. Radians, right. So um, it's minus 270 degrees or minus 3 pi over 2 radians, right, uh, at 10 times if all three of them are top each other. You know, so fairly trivial. Okay, let's do one more before we finish today. Let's do a zero. So this one's very different. It's a capacitor in series with a resistor to ground. So what's the transfer function of this? Well, it's fairly, it's the same old voltage divider again, except now it's R over R plus 1 over J omega C. Multiply top bottom by J omega C, we get J omega RC over 1 plus J omega RC. So this is a little bit different than we had before, right? We got something in the numerator. Numera zeros are in the numerator, poles are things in the denominator. This is a zero at zero frequency, so it's kind of a special one. The way to look at this, though, is to break it into two parts. J omega RC, there's the zero part, and then the pole part, 1 plus J omega over omega 3 dB. So this we've already worked with. The zero is going to add in just like multiple poles added together. What's the phase shift of this zero, which is at zero frequency? These are poles at finite frequency. This is a pole a zero at zero frequency, so it's kind of a special. There's no one plus, right? So what's the phase shift of this zero? What's the phase shift we get from this zero? What's J correspond to? How much phase shift? 90 degrees. So this, we always, we just get a phase shift of 90 degrees right off the bat with this thing. Then what's going to, now, what direction? Is it plus 90 or minus 90? It's plus 90 degrees. So this thing starts off with a phase shift of plus 90 degrees at zero, at very low frequency. And since this is a log frequency scale, it just starts off, you know, and this is zero here, it starts off at minus, at plus 90. Now, what happens when we get to this pole? This pole at 10 times below omega 3 dB, so let's say this is omega 3 dB, at 10 times below it, this pole starts to add negative phase shift, right? So it's going to start dropping, okay? At 0.1 mega. At mega 3 dB, this will be at a phase shift of what? Plus 90 from the zero, minus 45 from the pole, gives us a plus 45 overall. So this thing will go down to plus 45. And at 10 times above, at 10 omega 3 dB, we're back down to 0 degrees phase shift. OK? So what, and what's the gain at 0 degrees? Can, can you tell me that one? Way to do is look, go to the limits. At 0, at I mean, at, at when this thing's at very high frequency, the 1 is le cancels out, the RCs cancel out, the Js cancel out, everything cancels out, comes up equal to 1. So at very high gain, this thing comes equal to 1. High frequency, this thing comes equal to 1. All right. What happens at zero frequency? At zero frequency, 1 plus J omega over RC, this goes to 0. We have J omega RC over 1. At zero frequency, the gain goes to zero. That's why it's called a zero, right? Zeros are zero, okay? Have a zero, zero amplitude. So this thing goes to zero. So this thing has a magnitude response like this. It's basically the sum of two. So what's the sum we're doing now? The zero has a, a it always, it's J omega RC, right? So it's increasing as omega. So that's what the zero is doing. Our pole, on the other hand, is doing this. It goes out, 
right? And at some point, it will begin. Let me not. I want to do this. I know why I want to do this. This is the mega 3 dB point of this pole, OK? OK? And what's if we add these two things together, what are we going to get? We're going to get something that looks like this. This, this plus 1 will follow. And this is log. This is 0 dB, right? So we'll have it'll these two, this will follow the zero curve until we get to the point where the zero in the pole to the zero the three dB frequency of the pole, then the pole is falling off it inversely proportional to omega. This is increasing as proportional to omega. So what's going to happen? These two things, if you add them together, it comes zero. Or if we just cancel out, does this? So this is a zero plus a pole does this. And a, okay. All right. We'll do some more examples next time. And then we'll start back to circuits again. Gain magazine. 